Well, thank, thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you, Kate, very much for hosting this event and providing an opportunity for me to meet so many wonderful people and so many wonderful Democrats. Um, as many of you know, I've been walking around the state, um, and I have uh, I put in about 530 miles, I think. We walked uh, 15 miles today uh, from uh, Haverhill through Lawrence and into Andover. I, I literally just came off the road, um, so I apologize. My, my attire it's a little less formal than I, I normally uh, do up at the State House and in other professional venues. Um, we've been to over, uh, we, I think today we hit 100 towns and cities that we visited, um, and I've met over 2,000 people and heard their voices and listened to their concerns and, and their thoughts and their anxieties, as Carolyn talked about. Um, and what I have tried to do literally in the past 24 hours in preparation for this very important event, because I Kate would be able to pull together perhaps the biggest DTC crowd that, that I've uh, been able to talk to um, since I got into this race two months ago. And indeed, I, I think this is the biggest group um, outside of the convention. Uh, is I've been just trying to distill and crystallize and put down on paper uh, a lot of the learnings that I have, uh, I have gained over the course of the past six weeks on this walk. I started on July 2nd. Um, just to review for folks, uh, in Wayland, where I'm a state rep, I represent Lincoln, Sudbury, and Wayland, and uh, I walked from Wayland to Fitchburg, Fitchburg, all the way out to North Adams, through towns like uh, Gardner, and Orange, and Greenfield, and Shelburne Falls. I went to Pittsfield, I went to Northampton, Springfield, I uh, went to Munson and did some community service cleanup there, the tornado damage, and trying to lead by example, which is a, a theme of my campaign that I'll touch on a little bit. We went to Worcester and Brockton and Taunton, uh, Fall River, New Bedford, where the unemployment rate in those two cities is 13 to 17 percent. Um, astounding to uh, a lot of us here, not far from Boston. Um, I did the Cape all last week, uh, walked over the Sagamore Bridge on Monday and walked all the way up and left P-Town uh, at on 3 o'clock ferry and headed to Boston. Drove up to Gloucester, went to a DCC, DTC meeting up there Friday night, and we've been walking from Gloucester um, uh, to Andover over the course of the past couple of days. I have not had um, a day off from the road in two weeks. So here's what I did, and here's what I will propose. I, I'm going to have to read a little bit of what I wrote, uh, because I think your voices and the voices that I heard uh, throughout this walk and throughout this Commonwealth are very, very important, and I want to get it right. And, and Put some new things down uh, on top of my stunt speech, uh, and, and literally because I was walking and on the phone, and I'm doing fundraising calls while I'm walking, I'm, I'm talking to elected officials, I'm setting up meetings that are in advance. It's a very busy walk. We're tweeting along the way. Um, it's very interactive and, and very sort of uh, modern in a sense. Um, and so what I'd like to do is, is share with you some of my learnings. Um, and offer a better future for all of us here in Massachusetts. Uh, and certainly I'm, I'm going to be asking for all of your support uh, for my candidacy uh, along the way. So the people, as, as Carolyn correctly said, the people of Massachusetts are anxious. They are worried. They are very concerned. Uh, I have talked to firefighters, farmers, fishermen, business owners, carpenters, electricians, hotel workers, priests, students, teachers, the unemployed and the employed. We had wrenching conversations with Mike in Fitchburg, who had been working for 30 years. And at, at the age of 52, he's now out of work. Doesn't know where to go with his life. Hasn't been working for, for a couple of years and doesn't have the kind of, he's got skills that, that, are, that are too good and too specific to the kind of job opportunities that are out there. And so he's looking at something that's Ten bucks an hour at a retail store. <coughs> That's not a real opportunity for Mike. We heard from Jen in Shelburne Falls on the way to North Adams. Single mom, developmentally disabled daughter, 23 years old. Can't care for herself. They need a nurse assistant in the house. Uh, Jen's salary isn't good enough to pay for that that assistant, that personal assistant in the home. It's too expensive. Jen keeps on having to go back home to, to care for her daughter in the middle of the day. It's disrupting her ability to preserve her career, preserve her job, retain her income. She's scared about the future. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her daughter. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her career. She's frightened. 
We heard from Lois, a senior out in Springfield. Social Security funds and Social Security payments have been flat for the past three years. And yet she's facing higher gas prices, higher food prices, higher uh, prescription drug prices. She can't make ends meet. She's practically in tears at the senior center talking. And I talked to um, Terry in Brockton, 25 years as a mechanic in a, uh, in a plant, a precision manufacturing plant uh, in Brockton that made uh, microscopic slides. Very technical, very expert kind of work. Did that for 25 years. He's 54 years old. I saw him and talked to him at a beaten down, broken, glass, broken employment agency in downtown Brockton on the south side of town. He was hoping that day to get a single day worth of work at 8.25 an hour, wherever. He didn't care. But that was the best that he could do. He'd been out of work for almost three years. He's scared. He's scared. He doesn't know where his next meal is coming from. That's what I am hearing out there. And the people that have jobs are frightened about how they're going to be able to retain their jobs. They are frightened about their futures. They are worried about the value of their homes, the rising cost of health care and higher education for their children. They're worried about the security and stability of their retirement savings. They want a predictable and secure future. Opportunities for steady middle class jobs for themselves, for their children, with decent wages and decent jobs. They want the economy in America to be strong. They want businesses to start hiring again instead of outsourcing their jobs overseas. And they want Washington to start functioning properly again. And they want Congress to focus on the people's priorities instead of their own. Now, the people of Massachusetts want even more. And they deserve it. They want to have faith again in the American promise. The American promise that is a compact. It is, a, it is an agreement between this country and its people and the collective energies of this people. It's an understanding in which if I study hard and I work hard and I abide by the law and I, and I am respectful of others, then I'm going to have an opportunity to succeed in this world and in this country. And, and if we are determined, this contact is in essence saying, if we are determined and diligent and disciplined, we will have the freedom to choose a career path in which we can have a stable and secure future and feel fulfilled and be rewarded appropriately. And if we uphold the abiding character that is so much at the core of what has made Massachusetts great in this state, a character of courage, judgment, integrity, and dedication, then we will enjoy the quality of life that goes beyond the wildest dreams of our ancestors. That is part of this compact. And we want, as a people, to preserve the promise of that compact for the next generation and for our children's children. But we are at a very distressing point in our history. And that compact is cracking, and that promise people fear is being broken. The structure underneath our society seems to be changing and for the worse. Too often we see greed on Wall Street rewarded immensely out of proportion to any common sense or decency in society. Too often we see selfish CEOs exalted as models of success at the expense of all of us. And we worry that opportunities reside only for the few and the vast majority of us are being left behind. Now, to all of those who share some of these fears, and that might include some of you in this room, I offer confidence in our ability as a nation of diverse people and diverse voices to overcome any such obstacles. We have a long and successful history of, con of constant improvement and responding to stubbornness and resistance with resilience. As a free people, we have always adapted, changed, and created and improved our collective situation whenever we have faced threats to a better future for all of us. But this ability to grow and improve and change and adapt 
by sharing our collective voices and our collective ideas is threatened by the stubbornness and the reckless and radical right embodied by people like Michelle Bachman and Rush Limbaugh and Grover Norquist. In addition, huge corporations are squelching and drowning your voices and our voices collectively through the Citizens United ruling and PAC money and huge special interest funds. <coughs> and that is why I want to offer to be your voice and your advocate against these radical forces of the right. As your next Senator in Washington, I vow to carry your voices into the halls of Congress, to advocate for your priorities, to share your vision for a brighter future. And here is what you have all shared with me on my walk. We want a just and fair society that rewards good behavior. We want a tax policy in which the super rich contribute their fair share of the burden of civilization that all of us share. We want great schools so that we can be the best educated citizens 